Good, good morning once again. Welcome to the Trinity Forum. It's been a little while. I guess we'd say it's been a minute, a couple months since we've had one. Happy Pride to you uh, and, uh, and blessings to each and every one of you. This morning, I'm joined by Jess Sellers and Ashley Fahey. Uh, am I pronouncing that right, Ashley Fahey? Fahey. Fahey, okay. Uh, Ashley Fahey, Jess Sellers uh, of, of PFLAG. And, that, and Jess Sellers is a licensed uh, uh, psychologist specializing in the treatment of adults, especially young adults and early career professionals. And as, most importantly, Jess was instrumental in helping to establish the now 37-year history uh, of a relationship between Trinity Cathedral and PFLAG here in Trinity, uh, here in Cleveland. And so this is really special to have Jess here with us. Uh, and Ashley Fahey is a proud trans transgender woman and a sustainability professional. She holds an undergraduate degree in sustainable business as an, an, and an executive MBA degree, and has been working in corporate sustainability for 14 years. Ashley transitioned to living full-time as her authentic self in 2018 at the age of 28 and she moved, as she moved from Michigan to Ohio for a job initially with Goodyear. There she found a welcoming and supportive environment, eventually becoming president of the Goodyear Pride Network. She also joined PFLAG, PFLAG, PFLAG at Clevesme shortly after moving to Northeast Ohio and has been serving as membership chair on their advisory board since 2019. She also serves as a member, member of IdeaStream's Public Media Community Advisory Board. Ashley began working for Kohler, Kohler Company in late 2021 as senior manager, global product sustainability, and works remotely from her home in Cuyahoga Falls, where she enjoys hiking with her girlfriend, biking, golfing, playing guitar, and spending time with her dog, Honey. Welcome to both of you. Excuse me, I'm going to get a sip of water as apparently my mouth is so dry, I'm not speaking well. I do a lot of talking on a Sunday morning, and usually by about this time, not all the letters get pronounced. Well, welcome to both of you. And I think, would you like to, should we start with a little video of, of PFLAG, or, or do you all want to start by, I think what we'll do is that. Before we begin chatting, uh, they brought a video that shares some really important stuff, parts about what PFLAG does. Thank you. I was about 19, freshman in college. He came into my bedroom one night crying and said, I have to tell you something. I was surprised because she had been dating men forever. I was not the ideal father when Brad and I first had that conversation. It took me a little while and I think partly because I was afraid for him. You would like to think that we would be further along than we are and I think the support of loved ones and family and, and friends and people who have been on the journey can make the difference between life and death. The coming out process isn't just about the child, the person who's gay, it's also for the parents. The key for supporting a child is actually coming out yourself. That's the huge piece. Coming out onto Facebook saying, I'm proud of my son, he's gay, or my daughter, she's a lesbian, and I love her, and I'll support her forever. That's what your child really wants to hear. When they hear that, you got them. I don't think a child could do this that successfully without parent support, because we're the first people to, to be the teachers. So she did this little poster for you. It says, Dear Reed, I am so incredibly honored to be your mother. You are an amazing young man. You are not only very talented, but have great inner strength and character. I will always love you, Mom. Bradley, we are so proud of who you are today and all you will be tomorrow. And you are our superstar. Love, mom, and pops. We love you madly, Bradley. <laughs> that's the same. <laughs> What's your name? Bradley. Me, that's me. Yeah, this is pretty special. Do I get to keep one of these? <laughs> you are, you are my heart. I love you beyond measure, and I just want to be on the journey with you wherever it takes you. And I'm super proud of your courage. Love you. Jason, you are the light of our lives. We are very proud of you. You inspire us, 
you are true joy. I love every aspect of, of who you are as a person and I'm thankful every day that we've given the world you. Coming out as your authentic self is scary and takes a lot of courage. You've got the strength to look for the people out there that can support you. So don't, don't give up hope. You're special and you deserve to be loved. That's incredibly powerful. And I'm, I'm, I have my head, my back, it's behind me, I can't see it, but I'm looking out and I'm, I'm seeing a lot of um, folks who are touched by this. And I know when I watched this yesterday, uh, I, was, I was really touched by it. Um, why is that? We'll start the conversation there. Why, why do I, as a straight man, who, but I am a parent, watch this and there's something about this that, that I believe the phrase is all the feels. Um, you know, we get that. Why, why is the, the, this such an important um, expression of what matters? Well, I too, uh, I've seen this scores of times, and I too still uh, get a little emotional and choked up. I think, I think in this world of hate and division, struggles, it's so nice to see uh, authentic, pure love and acceptance. And I think the video captures it so nicely. And it is what uh, has happened in a PFLAG meeting for 37 years now, most of those years here in Trinity Cathedral too. But I do think that the, we want to see things like this. We want to be reminded in this um, uh, divisive world of ours that we have moments that come from our personal stories of love and acceptance. And if I, I can add to that, you know, I think the, the simple messages of love that we saw in that video are things that as parents, and I'm not a parent, but as parents, I think are largely expected. It's kind of part of the job, right? You assume that you're going to love your children and support them and want the best for them. Um, and unfortunately, historically, a large part of the LGBTQ plus community have faced rejection and ostracization and, you know, um, and have been distanced from their families, sometimes forcefully. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it is those simple messages that, al although that, that should just be the norm, um, can be so powerful in this context. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I think the authentic self and the love right. that speaks to what the bond right. that, that God right. created us to have mm -hmm. with the people who are um, our family, our family of birth, our chosen family, mm -hmm. it, it's certainly universal, but we get to it through something that's really particular and needed through yeah, this. Yeah. Well, let's start by sharing a little mm. bit of, of PFLAG's story. Mm. Um, Jess, would you share a bit of, well, for those of us who might not know <laughs> everything from mm. what PFLAG stands for right. and mm -hmm. what they stand for, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and as well as what brought PFLAG to Trinity all those many years ago? Sure. So in 1972, Jean Manford, uh, the mother uh, who had a gay son in New York City, decided to march in what uh, it was probably one of the very early pride parades. And, um, and then later on, uh, Dear Abby uh, wrote an article about accepting uh, our LGBTQ uh, sons and daughters. That was uh, somewhere in the late 70s, I believe. And she received over 7,000 letters at the time asking, how do I find a PFLAG group? And so PFLAG groups began to emerge in the early 1980s, and ours started here in Cleveland in 1985. Um, I want to just mention uh, a couple of things about our beginning here, because it's really wrapped around and it's, uh, it's anchored here in, in Trinity Cathedral. Even the, uh, for those of members who are here, um, some of you might remember that you had a basement, um, right, right. and so that basement. Commerce. The, the Comarts room, is that right? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Toby. And um, that's where we met. And the story goes that Rob Daroff, uh, an undergraduate student at the time at Case Western Reserve University, uh, urged his mother to establish a PFLAG meeting here in Cleveland after attending one at Akron. Akron was the first one in the state of Ohio. 
Ours was the second one to establish itself. Rob went to dozens of churches and facilities in the Cleveland area, and it was only Trinity who said yes. Hmm. At the time, if you remember, this, this is not long after the Anita Bryant cases and speaking out in Florida, and it was not a good time for acceptance and welcoming LGBTQ people here in Cleveland either. Jane and her son, uh, Rob, actually appeared on local television programs using just their first names for fear of retribution. But when you think about the courage that they had to start this, it was amazing. So I'm kind of the tag along because Jane and I, um, I was working uh, and worked at Case Western Reserve University as the um, director of the counseling center for 34 years. And um, Jane, pulled me aside one day and said, will you help me do this? And uh, as she tells the story, um, she and I both thought it would probably be three months to a year that we would be doing this here at Trinity, and here we are in our 37th year. Mm. Um, there's a great, there continues to be a great need, I think, for this kind of uh, uh, venue, this kind of safer space for us to talk and help families, parents, uh, family members, and LGBTQ individuals to come together and talk. And I think um, that uh, storytelling is so important. I'll pause here because I wanted to just give you that, a little bit of that history. But I do think the story, storytelling, as you heard on the video, occurs in rooms like this or in our Zoom calls. And that, that really makes a difference. Thank you. And, mm -hmm. and I would say I, I was there for, we were to have the 35th anniversary, mm -hmm. yes. and that was the first October of the pandemic. Right. And then mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. year was the 36th anniversary, right. and we, we gathered. And I, I remember part of our, our conversation helped me to realize mm -hmm. I, I'm certainly grateful that 37 years ago this was a space for, for you all, yeah. but it's not hard to look at these past three and a half decades and yeah. realize how much that relationship has shaped Trinity oh, uh, and how much we have been informed by that. So mm -hmm. it's certainly been mutual. Oh, that's nice. Um, and cool. I think we are that much um, richer as the, mm -hmm. uh, as the place that God intends us to yeah. be because of yeah. it. So we're, yeah. we're mm -hmm. very grateful. We're very grateful. Very good. So, Ashley, what about what is your relationship with PFLAG? What brings you, you shared beforehand a little bit what brought you to Cleveland? Good year, right, mm -hmm. originally, <laughs> right? Yes, that's but right. then what, what brought you uh, to PFLAG? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and, and to give a little additional context, I think you, you know, uh, thank you for the introduction earlier and thanks for having us. But um, as a, a transgender woman, I, I didn't, you know, I, I've felt this way my entire life. Um, but I didn't really know what it was. I didn't take the time to explore who I was um, until after I was, you know, grown up and married for almost five years, and you know, out in the world. Um, and I think a large part of that was probably because of the environment that I grew up in. I, I grew up largely in the 1990s, and uh, you know, the culture we live in now is much more uh, comfortable talking about these issues, even if there's not necessarily universal support, unfortunately. Uh, and so it, it's easier, I think, for, for um, young people today to feel more comfortable being themselves. Uh, but yeah, that was my journey. I, I um, realized that I was transgender in, um, in 2017 when I was 27 years old, transitioned a year later. Uh, and it was the job with Goodyear that brought me here um, but I actually, um, you know, because I was just on the cusp of, of coming out, I had not really been out publicly yet. And so I had to apply to the job with Goodyear with my previous name and my previous pronouns and my LinkedIn profile, you know, had my old picture on it and everything else. Um, and when I showed up to the in-person interview in Akron, um, I was wearing a suit and tie and, you know, the whole nine yards. And I asked, I, I knew that, you know, I, I wanted to come out to the hiring manager. I didn't want this to be a secret. And so um, I asked if I could have lunch with, um, with the hiring manager before I left the interview. 
And at the end of the lunch, I, I said, you know, there's one more thing I I'd like to talk to you about. I'm a transgender woman, and uh, I am ready to transition. I'm, uh, but I, I said, you know, it's not something that affects my education or my work experience or my ability to be effective in, in my position. But I think that it may be easier for, you know, people at Goodyear to just get to know me as Ashley versus having to meet me one way and kind of make a transition with me, right? Um, it's, it, it is more complicated that way, although people do it all the time. And she came back uh, almost immediately and said, well, we have um, a, a group called the Goodyear Pride Network on campus here. Uh, and, you know, she said, I, I think we have, um, you know, LGBTQ inclusive health benefits and our team is really great and, and wonderful. And uh, three days later, I got an offer from, from Goodyear for that job. Um, and so I was able to start on my first day as Ashley, which was a little scary, but, yeah. uh, but also very yeah. exciting. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, nothing but support you know, within that organization in the three years that I worked there. Um, and, and as the Reverend mentioned, I, I was president of the Goodyear Pride Network before I left. Um, so, and what brought me to PFLAG Cleveland was actually my first week of work there. I, you know, I didn't know anybody in the area. I was moving to a new place. I didn't have family here or friends. Um, I was, you know, coming into my own identity and I realized that I needed to find a network. I needed to find, you know, friends and support. And so um, it was actually our chief health officer at Goodyear, who's uh, since moved on to another role at a different company, Brent Pilecki. Uh, Dr. Brent Pilecki, and he, um, I met with him my first day there. He's also a gay man and, uh, you know, so part of the community. And um, he was very welcoming, made me feel right at home at Goodyear. But he said, you know, there's this group that I've been involved in called PFLAG up in Cleveland, and you should check it out sometime. So, um, and that was leading up to the August 2018 support group meeting. So I came up here, and I think Brent came with me uh, that, that meeting. And that was my introduction to PFLAG Cleveland. And I've been coming every single month uh, since right. then. And I joined right. the advisory board um, less than a year later in, in uh, spring of 2019. Ashley, your, your story really brings home for me um, the importance of uh, organizations like Goodyear or any company creating mm -hmm. not only a place of safety, but also to provide uh, a culture, but also resources that mm -hmm. allow you, and it sounds like the co coincidence of timing really emphasized that, that, that mm -hmm. allowed the clean break. But the fact that they were there, it's a reminder that any of us, whether our organization is a church, whether it's a, a yes. you know, you name your company, yeah. the, the ability, the need to create um, systems of support is really vital and important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think not just from a social perspective, it's great to have that, you know, me coming into that organization and feeling supported and feeling at home. But mm -hmm. um, even from a business perspective, you know, for, for companies who have employee resource groups or business resource groups like the Goodyear Pride Network, um, it, it helps to create a deeper culture uh, within the organization, mm -hmm. and that helps you to attract and retain, you know, yeah. new associates right. and, and existing associates. If they hadn't had that Goodyear Pride Network, and if they, you know, if I hadn't seen that they had some kind of safe, inclusive, supportive system in place, I don't know that I would be in Cleveland today, you know, I don't, right. or in Akron. I, you know, I may not have come to the area because that was an important part of me, you know, coming out and, and living authentically. Mm -hmm. right. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and I was going to add that I think um, my experience uh, over 40-some years has, has been the transformation of higher education around this issue. Early on, colleges and universities began to incorporate non-discrimination clauses, um, expanded them to include LGBTQ individuals. And, um, and that, I think, is a remarkable thing as I look at uh, the history with Case Western Reserve sort of leading the way here regionally, if not in the state, uh, for domestic partnership benefits at the time before marriage equality. Very important kind of uh, transformational things were occurring in higher education. Well, let's talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the space of PFLAG itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it... Um, how much of PFLAG is a support group for LGBTQ folks? 
how much of it is a support group for uh, the parents and families of how how does mm -hmm. how does that I would say how does it work but I also have a very practical question I think I sure. asked you that mm -hmm. in our initial thing because it, it, these are you know this this is a mutually supportive you're, you're we're trying to bring together not mm -hmm. only LGBTQ plus folks, but also their families, their support systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and which tells me two things, that one, it needs to be a space of safety and warmth and support and right. openness, especially for those people who are LGBTQ plus. Right. And, and I say this as the parent of a non-binary child, mm -hmm. You also need space for those parents to come in and say dumb things, right? right? <laughs> to like go through that process of expression. I mean, so uh -huh. I hear, uh -huh. um, but, but that's life, right? right. And that right. at my first, and when I think about how, you know, navigating that in our own household, I, I think, wait a minute, there's something not safe about that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So does that come up? I mean, how do, how do you all kind of navigate that and maybe it's the most maybe it's the most sacred space. Tell me how that works. I guess that's a bunch of questions. Well, like, how does it work? <laughs> and then, how do I deal with Owens? Is weird question, right? right? right how, no. Why don't you put him in the room? I assure you, we heard some very dumb things, and, oh and some of them came from my mouth. I'm sure over the over the many years. But um, I, I I I think uh, so. Many P flags probably. Almost all, I think, in the country, and there are over 425 to 450 of them nationally. Um, I think they have historically separated parents, for, and uh, I know they may may come together all at one uh, all at one time, and, but they have breakout sessions and rooms to go for affiliation for LGBT individuals and one room for parents. But Jane and I, uh, Jane is a, li a licensed social worker and I'm a licensed psychologist, and I think we bring a unique quality, a perspective about the value of bringing people together and having them talk in the same room and allowing them to say, um, ask questions that are really sort of 101 kind of um, uh, LGBTQ, P flag 101 kind of questions. And for in the safety of the room in this confidential group, which we always stress, uh, we have found that the dynamic between and among individuals, both it's sort of an intergenerational kind of experience. And, it, and this concept known to psychologists as the recapitulation of the family group sounds like a a long uh, and involved uh, title of that, that but Ir Irving uh, Yalom wrote, uh, uh, a, a, a famous uh, psych psychoanalyst, wrote a book about uh, group psychotherapy. And the one thing he mentioned is that groups have a curative factor. And we bring that notion into, this, uh, into our PFLAG meetings, recognizing that when we can reconstruct to some degree what it might be like to have a dynamic discussion between and among young, older, straight, parents, out, trans, you know, this interaction is very rich and it actually brings about, I think, a large degree of tolerance for parents that are a little bit behind on the pronouns, perhaps, or hearing somebody, you know, express their frustration and anger as well as their tears and sorrow and their struggle. So I, I, I love the dynamic. I think it's not, it's one that sort of comes from the social work and psychology kind of background that we uh, bring to our PFLAG meetings. Yeah, and if I could add, I, um, I, I think it's, it's been helpful for those parents. And I think, you know, when you talk about, you know, maybe, maybe the comments, right, that, that mm -hmm. parents may make, um, I think the the baseline that it, that we said is that if they're coming to a P flag meeting, it's because they they are trying to be supportive of their child, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. typically we don't get any, you know, I, I have not experienced at least in my time there, we don't get you know comments that are hurtful or hateful or you know th those mm -hmm. things of rejection. It's it's more about parents being confused or concerned for the safety and well-being mm -hmm. of their children, um, 
you know, struggling with the education mm -hmm. piece, right, with learning non-binary pronouns or different pronouns or a different mm -hmm. name and, and getting that consistent, um, they come with a lot of questions and concerns often. Right. But it's not usually, you know, this is, this is the wrong path for my child. It's mm -hmm. how do I be supportive as a parent? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the experience with my parents. And, and my parents have been to PFLAG meetings, although um, it, that was not at first you know, where we went. Um, when I came out as transgender to my family, they were all very loving and supportive um, right up front. You know, you will always be our, our child. We will always mm -hmm. love you, which is not the case with, with all people, right. you know, in the LGBTQ community. And mm -hmm. I felt very grateful for that. But it was still very difficult for my parents. My mom, you know, told me that she cried every single day for about three months, you know, following mm -hmm. my coming out to her because she was so concerned about, you know, was I going to be okay? Was I going to have job opportunities? Was I going to be able to be successful and have a happy life? Was I going to be able to find a partner, you know, to spend my life with if that's what I wanted? Mm -hmm. um, she had so many questions. And, and what I told her, this was my personal experience, was write down all of your questions and concerns as they come up and you and I will have a conversation once every maybe couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and we can just go through your list and, and address the question, you know, e each question by question. And that was incredibly helpful for her. And by the end of that, um, after a few months, she had already expressed all of those concerns, mm -hmm. and I was able to address them because I had been living with these feelings for my entire life. Uh, and I was able to say, look, this isn't new. I, you know, I know who I am. I've thought about this. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And I think at our meetings, um, one of the important things about the dynamic that we have you're describing is that a parent of a child who has come out as gay, as lesbian, as bisexual, transgender, or something else, um, is able to bring those concerns, those, you know, I want to support my child, I just don't know how. And having other people in the room like myself who have been through this and who are part of that community can often be helpful for them because they can, they can get their questions asked. Sometimes they feel like they're asking stupid right. questions mm -hmm. in a safe, supportive environment, and they don't have to feel like they're hurting or you know, making their, ch their own child feel awkward, right? They can mm -hmm. ask that of somebody who, who's familiar with the topic uh, who can provide those resources, and then they can go back to their own child and be the supportive questions. parent they want to be. In a safe, supportive right. environment. Yeah, it it seems that there's there's like kind of a, an ebb and flow. Um, the, the the parental side of coming out is there's a letting go, uh, right. and that's going to look different at every. I'm, I'm figuring this out. You know, this is <laughs> as we go. Um, but that's going to look different at every stage of parenthood. You know, what is the mm -hmm. age of the child? Because right. that's what parenthood is about anyway, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's not not being a parent anymore. It's not about loving. It's about at different stages of a child's development of letting go exactly. of who you thought they were at that time mm -hmm. and giving space to grow sure. and to flourish. Sure. Um, so, you know, how, um, I wonder if this, this might be giving you all a chance to totally state the obvious. <laughs> um, but but when you know parents at any mm -hmm. level, care, you know, caring for this, whether they're sort of stumbling with the pronouns, whether they're kind of navigating their own thoughts, projections, needs, you name it, what what is sort of if, if, what's on the pamphlet that says, okay, here's the first things you need to do, no matter what, to care for your 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 child, your young adult, your who is who is going through a, a coming out or a transitioning program. This is what you need to think about. Do, and, and then we'll figure the rest out later. Sure. What is the most important? I mean, I, I, I would just say love, you know, just yeah. let your child know that they are loved, you know, mm -hmm. you, you want them to be happy, right? You support mm -hmm. them, even if you don't have it all figured out, right? Start with love um, and acceptance as a baseline and the rest, you know, the rest can be worked through. Right. Right. And I think too, uh, sometimes when it does begin for a parent uh, that they have intense feelings of loss, uh, painful kind of loss in terms of the dreams, the hopes and dreams they may have had about, you know, a daughter having a wedding wasn't, you know, early on before t 2015. Many parents spoke of like my daughter, I'll never be able to walk my daughter down the aisle or there were moments I think in our conversations where parents just had to cry about this loss, and um, and and if you're struck, if parents are struggling, then I think 
what the primer for me is, hey, get yourself to a PFLAG group, have a safe, begin that safe conversation with people who have walked that path, walked that mile or two before you, so that we can help you and get the, get the kind of help you need. Um, uh, uh, back to one of our stories, too, that I think it was just a beautiful moment about a year ago. This happened on, uh, during our virtual call. Um, a, a young person, a transgender person, um, talked about how um, the, the photographs of um, uh, their childhood photographs and got to talking about how it was awkward and she didn't like seeing them. I hope I'm remembering the story exactly. But um, And another parent uh, was present with uh, her daughter and a transgender daughter. And they spoke up and said, well, how do you feel when you come to our home and see the photographs in the hallway, walking down the hallway? And there was a grace about that moment. The, her daughter said, it's OK, Mom. It's OK, Dad. He was there as well. Um, you know, it's, I get it that that's part of who, you, who I was at that time. You don't need to put them away. You don't need to hide them. But I do think, and I hope you'll see, uh, I can see pictures of myself in my life today, you know, more out in the living room and spaces in, uh, in the home that I, I just thought that was a beautiful moment. Um, and I think those kind of conversations occur all the time uh, when we can get together and have that personal story and the grace like, I think a lot of what we do is to help people find grace in their questions and their responses, to be patient. To un uh, it is often said that, you know, uh, an LGBTQ individual may have had 10, 27 years to figure this out. And they want some of them, some people want 27 seconds for their parents to use the right pronoun or respect them because they, uh, are bringing home a partner for Thanksgiving. So we do work on that angle of this in, in, our, um, in the dynamic uh, in our, in our uh, discussions. And, and you know, one thing that we often say in our meetings, and it's, it's part of giving the parents that grace uh, yeah. and understanding where they're at, is so often when a child comes out, whether it's you know, as trans or as gay or something mm -hmm. else, uh, the parent then kind of goes into the closet, right? right. Because they, they may have a lot of questions, they may not understand, they may not know how to tell the other members of their extended family or their mm -hmm. friends or whatever, and so it's hard for them, you know, and they may need to feel like this is their burden, their secret now, uh, and mm -hmm. they have to process and figure, figure that out. And I think part of the role that PFLAG can serve uh, in other types of support groups is offering that same love and support and grace to the parents who now feel like they're in the closet, right? right? right. Because, I, I, and I, th I think one of the reasons why parents extending that love is so important off the bat is because I, I think the number one thing that LGBTQ individuals fear and what makes it so difficult to come out to their families and their friends is the fear of rejection. You know, that's like the number one thing. I, I'm afraid right. when I bring this piece of information to light about who I am, that I will not be welcomed and accepted. I will be thrown out of the house. I will be excommunicated. I will be not loved mm -hmm. or not so, good enough or living up to my parents' expectations. And so offering that love and support from the start kind of dispels some of that tension that, that was there, right? Mm -hmm. And then again, you can mm -hmm. figure out the rest from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things uh, mm -hmm. that we'll, we'll talk about celebrations in a few minutes. But mm -hmm. but let's talk about what are what are some concerns right now, um, from a from a legislative standpoint. Some things that are in uh, uh, certainly naming what what has taken place in the Supreme Court over the last few days, and yes. which raises yes. issues of uh, equality and marriage equality in the future as well. Mm -hmm. But there's other things even before that that you and I spoke of briefly when, mm -hmm. when we talked about what. What is of greatest concern to you all right now? I, I personally believe that uh, there's a huge health risk out there for young adults when they see state legislatures 
passing or uh, considering uh, uh, statutes to place into law that would really discriminate against our young LGBTQ individuals, especially the transgender or gender nonconforming young adults that need time developmentally. They need time to figure out who they are. And to hear that government, that governments are instilling and, 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 and creating these um, uh, laws against saying, like in the state of Florida, don't say gay, um, which is really, you know, muzzling young adults, children, from even talking about if they do indeed have an aunt or an uncle with, who might be married to a same-sex partner, they can't talk about it. They can't even express the love that they see in their usual world in a classroom. And a teacher can't respond for fear of being fired. Uh, there are some, um, I, I, Ashley, you know of some legislation in the state uh, that just got, I think just got passed, tucked in, into another bill that would prevent one transgender person in the state of Ohio so far. It affects one known person from being on a sports team. The, one person. I don't know. Yeah, right? I, and you know, with regard to the sports issue, I think a lot of the sports organizations, especially at the high school level, the non-professional, non-elite yeah. levels, mm -hmm. have have come out and said, this is not an issue for us, right? <laughs> yeah. It's right. it's the legislature, right. the, the, you know, our, our, our Congress people who are making mm -hmm. these decisions, you know, and saying this is what's best when, uh, you know, the in my opinion, and I, I do not play sports in school, but um, you know, the point of sports is to to get to know people, right? To to make right. friends and connections and build those social skills and coordination skills and so many yeah. other things mm -hmm. that are fundamental to growing up. Uh, and to take that away from children just because of you know how they identify who they are, when the teams themselves are saying this is not an issue for us, is mm -hmm. really disheartening. Mm -hmm. um, and I think from a medical perspective. The bills that we see in many states around the country being introduced, and in some cases mm -hmm. passed, including in Ohio, around uh, health care for transgender uh, minors is, is also disheartening, especially when you consider uh, things like puberty blockers, which are, you know, the effects of which, you know, just it holds off a puberty until that child can make a decision, maybe mm -hmm. with their parents, maybe with their doctor, about mm -hmm. what's best for them. Um, the fact that that is no longer going to be allowed in, in many places is unfortunate because puberty does create irreversible changes, you know, in, in an individual. And if they're living, if they were born into a body that they no longer identify with and they have no way legally to stop it from developing in a way that, you know, is, is very uncomfortable for them, uh, that can be a real issue down the road in terms of mental health outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, many people may not know this if you're not, you know, directly involved in the community, but the the attempted suicide rate for transgender individuals is about mm -hmm. forty percent, yeah, four zero. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is not because you know being transgender, you know, just makes you suicidal. It's it's because of the rejection right. and the harassment and the discrimination that our community has faced for decades for centuries and, and continues to face in a lot of ways today. Mm -hmm. And I think things like marriage equality getting passed in 2015 and, and other, you know, our society in general becoming a little more opening and affirming, uh, at least at, at, at our level, not at the, the lawmaker level, has, has helped to you know, chip, at, chip away at those health, uh, mental health issues. And now seeing these decisions uh, that may affect and, and take away some of those rights, I think are just going to exacerbate the mental health issue and w will very realistically uh, mm -hmm. cause people, cause our community to lose more lives as a result. And that's, that's unfortunate. The, pro the, uh, the, the key protective factor for youth uh, risk of suicide, loving families, loving, welcoming, uh, communities of faith. We, we need to be out there. We, we have a mental health message and we've placed it into action these 37 years and we, we occasionally forget this, but we, it needs to be stated, we have saved lives. Merely, each PFLAG meet, wherever you are in a small town in, you know, 
central, you know, Nebraska or here in a city like ours, we need to be doing this work. And we're all volunteers, by the way. We all, we, we join together to make sure that we're generating a protective factor for youth. I, I just want to add one more thing mm -hmm. while we're on this topic, and that is, and this, this, what I'm about to bring up spans a lot of issues, not just, you know, LGBTQ issues, <laughs> but I think in, in some instances we have lawmakers who are, are making decisions for groups of people um, that they may not be personally affected by, right? In, in this right. case, when we talk about transgender youth in sports or in healthcare, um, you know, those who do not have a personal connection to that, uh, the, it's easy to legislate away some of those rights because it doesn't affect them personally. And mm -hmm. we've got a lot of people, you know, voting on these types of issues who don't have a personal stake, who don't know somebody personally who's gone through right. this issue. It's very different when you, when you have that personal connection. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'll say, uh, unfortunately, and, and we'll see how this plays out, but it, it is probably not going to stop at restricting transgender youth's rights because right. we already have some lawmakers out there who have publicly said and advocated for taking away the right uh, for uh, hormone replacement therapy, which is a, a key part of many people's mm -hmm. uh, gender transitions, taking that away from people between the ages of 18 and 25 because, you know, the brain has not fully developed, you know, and, and matured at that point. Mm -hmm. These are adults that we're talking about taking away the right to, to you know, for gender affirming care and medicine. Mm -hmm. they, they should absolutely be able to make their own decisions mm -hmm. And parents, along with their children, should be able to make the right decisions for, for them. Right. But we are seeing these rights increasingly um, restricted and taken away, which I think is, is really difficult. Yeah. What, um, what are you celebrating? Hmm. Wow. <clears throat> well, for me, the experience of uh, doing this for over 37 years, and some of you have actually attended um, uh, you know, on a busy day in the University Counseling Services, a case uh, on, a, on a Tuesday, Jane and I would meet in the hallway and we'd talk about, oh, do we have enough energy for tonight's group or what? You know, it's like, <laughs> it was a long day. And, feel that way at church sometimes. Oh, yeah, it's you can right. feel it, you know? And I, I think um, the amazing thing about it is Jane and I, Wednesday morning, would get together in the hallway and would say, that was an awesome group. That was so powerful. That was so moving. And it kept us going uh, for these 37 years. So I want to just get, you know, give a shout out to the power of telling stories, much like you might hear on StoryCorps. Uh, those of you who listen to NPR and know a little bit about StoryCorps, David, I say, began that project and uh, chronicles them, and I believe they're filed in the Library of Congress. These are intense moments, three to five minutes of two or a few people speaking about a changeable, a transactional moment, a shift from misunderstanding to love often, right, and respect. That's what I celebrate every time uh, we meet and the days afterwards. That keeps me going. That makes me feel like not just our PFLAG group, but Cleveland has changed significantly. Ohio, in a large part, has been changing. We take some steps back with these kinds of legislative um, uh, initiatives, but we are, I do think, the arc of progress uh, is on our favor. I still believe that. Obama said it many times. I still believe it. And we, are, we may feel set back at times, but that's my celebration, is the, the energy that it has given me all of these years. Yeah, and I, I think from my perspective as a younger person, I still mm -hmm. consider myself a younger person. You're going to take that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, go for it. <laughs> All right, fine. Younger, yeah. young, young, young person. I, yeah. I, I feel like I can't call myself young, yeah. but younger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even since the time that I grew up, and, and I, I said this was part of the reason I came out later in life and, and accepted who I was um, in my late 20s is because the, the environment has changed so much since then and largely in a positive way. Yes, we see these legislative setbacks. Yes, there are always going to be people, unfortunately, who fight against you know, the ability for us to just live our lives and be exactly mm -hmm. who we are. That is unfortunate, it's a reality. We're always gonna have those people out there. But I believe that th those groups of people are 
over time getting smaller and smaller. And I think one of the reasons is, going back to what, what I was saying before, is that when you have somebody who you know personally in your life who is part of the LGBTQ plus community, whether it's a child, whether it's a parent, whether it's an aunt and uncle, a, a grandparent, or a friend, uh, a coworker, right? Each of those personal relationships and connections that you have builds empathy and understanding in your heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've seen that over time as our society at, at large has gotten a little more inclusive and a little more open about talking about these things. And we've seen celebrities mm -hmm. come out who mm -hmm. are LGBTQ or have uh, children who are. Um, the number of people who don't have those personal connections and don't know somebody personally who is LGBTQ is shrinking. Um, I, w I was speaking at a conference on sustainability, nothing to do with LGBTQ issues, <laughs> recently in February in Arizona. And um, I, I surveyed the room. There were probably 100 or more people in the room. And I just said, you know, raise your hand if, you've, if you personally know somebody who is part of the LGBTQ plus community. And almost every single hand in that room shot up. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was not the case, you know, 10, 15, 20 years right. ago. It's, it's gotten a lot better. And, I, and that's what gives me hope, um, is, is that I know that the people who are making those decisions you know, in our leg legislative bodies won't be there forever. And, and mm -hmm. my generation and the generation of people who are, are knowing personally people in this community are going to be influencing our future more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what gives me hope. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we have a few minutes for questions if anybody ha has one at the moment. We're going to turn our camera around and face this lively crowd. <laughs> Diane. I am the grandparent of a transgender child. Um, it's OK. And the family has been extremely supportive, at least our side of the family. There are members who have been raised in fundamentalist kinds of uh, religions. And um, so that kind of thing also went on a lot of conflict on that side of the. the Dan, would you uh, stand so we can oh. see? OK, there you go. Oh, that doesn't do a whole lot, I know. But that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, would you slink down in so we can see over you? OK. <laughs> anyway. Um, being part of this church for the last 25 years or so um, has given me a total awareness of acceptance. Um, and I just want to say that the base for some of this rejection is through religion. And I don't know how we get around that. But I wish that our voice was bolder, louder, and more prominent. Um, for me, this past week, what occurred to me, this is not, I mean, it is, um, what, an offense against women and their rights, but it's also uh, an offense uh, against our religious freedom. And this church needs to be able to stand up and say that. We have the freedom to do what we believe is the right thing and not just the fundamentalists who are backing us into a corner to act under their theology. We have a different theology and it is against our freedom of religion for these things to be going on. Absolutely. So we've Bravo. got work to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and I know I don't speak on behalf of, you know, uh, uh, the church in any way, but... Go ahead. Um, <laughs> but I, I think the unfortunate thing, you know, I, I was raised uh, in, in a Christian church and by a Christian family, and, and you know, that was a, a very important part of my upbringing um, growing up. And I think, you know, one of, the thing that, one of the things that distances a lot of LGBTQ plus people from religious communities is the rejection that they find. Mm -hmm. And you know the, the funny thing I think about religion and, and specifically about the Bible is that um, there are so many different uh, uh, facets of religion, so many different beliefs, even within Christianity. Uh, and it's very easy to cherry pick you know, the parts of the Bible or the parts of your teachings uh, that best align with how you personally view the world and, and what you want to happen in the world. 
And so you've got people on one side who, you know, find these niche verses who, uh, you know, in their minds demonize homosexuality and anything associated with it, right? And they'll fight to the death for that. Um, and on the other hand, you look to the teachings of Jesus, you know, you look at his words, and you don't see anything about hate or rejection. All you find is love and acceptance and, uh, you know, fighting for those who, who are discriminated against and who are, you know, hurt or, or unfairly treated. So, you know, I, I hope that more and more people uh, can understand, you know, that, that those teachings within their own religion, within their own beliefs, do point toward love and should point toward acceptance. But I also think you're absolutely right that we live in a country that was founded upon freedom of religion. And, and that means that, that I'm willing to fight, you know, e even though I'm not part of the church anymore, uh, but I I'm willing to fight for the right of anybody who wants to practice Christianity or any other religion to practice that. You know, I, I, I want you to have that right. I want you to be able to believe what you believe, but it should not infringe on other people who, you know, do not subscribe to that particular religion, right? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, you know, what, what I would say about that, that issue. I think you're right. Other thoughts and questions? Toby. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Toby Radloff. Um, as a member of Trinity Cathedral for, you know, for 46 years and a member of PFLAG for 32 years, wow. I credit both Trinity Cathedral and PFLAG in my coming out process. When I first joined Trinity back in the fall of 76, I was like referred there by a guidance counselor at Bedford High School who, was in the, who used to be in the choir. Um, she introduced me to Dean Perry Williams, and I sort of like, you know, I was a little bit reluctant to go to a church because we really didn't go to church in my family. And we've all been raised Protestants, even though Bedford was largely Roman Catholic. Um, I felt very comfortable the moment I stepped into the cathedral, and I have like attended the services ever since, but then knowing me, my grandfather was known to be homophobic, and I was sort of afraid, in a way, to come out to other members of my family. My mother and my stepfather have pretty much known I was gay, and I've known since I was, I was gay since I was like 12 or 13 years old. Mm. And I remembered back in 1973, I was sort of like trying to explore my sexuality at school, but also I was bullied and picked on a lot, and that made me feel very uncomfortable there. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point where the principal got wind of it and sent a letter to my parents saying that I need to get counseling for my homosexual tendencies. That was back in 73, you know, right mm -hmm. when they took it off of, this, off of the psychiatric thing. Right. But then again, fast forwarding, I became aware that there were LGBTQs going to the going to Trinity, and but I was still sort of closeted, you know, coming out to other people at the church. Like there was like one time, like back in about '84, '85, uh, you know, an out gay black guy came to the cathedral wanting to talk to people, and I sort of got to know him because I ran into him in later years at the LGBT center in a group. But I was sort of afraid to come out to him because I didn't know how other people in the cathedral reacted. And this is at a time when the surrounding neighborhood was still like mostly porno shops and cheap hotels. Hmm. And I just didn't want people to get any ideas. But then again, by 1990, I became aware of integrity, and I started going to integrity, which is like the gay LGBTQ Episcopalian group, and they met up at St. Peter's Church in Lakewood, and then same year I joined PFLAG for the first time, and yeah. I got involved with both of these groups, and I attended the meetings, and that sort of cemented my coming out process. Yeah. I also started going to gay prides in 1990. I missed like the very first gay pride in 89, and I was sort of reluctant to go there for fear that 
my parents or grandparents might see me on the six o'clock news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I kept going to Pride because I felt comfortable going to Pride. I felt comfortable going to these groups. And I am out and proud. I became out and proud both with Trinity, with P Flag, and later on, you know, with VA, because VA is a lot of LGBTQ work in there, and they even have a pride group there, and they have appeared at pride parades and pride festivals as well, you know, with a table and that. Mm -hmm. And pretty much, and also like the social media, I'm pretty much out to everywhere. So basically, most people that I'm that I know, whether it's through my high school, you know, I've been to the reunions, whether it's through Trinity, whether it's through P Flag, whether it's through VA, whether it's through social media, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, people know me as gay, and I have a lot of friends, even a lot of Facebook friends that I've never met face to face, but I did meet a few of them eventually, know about me. And that, and that basically made me feel comfortable for Good. my he, him, his identity. Good. And I'm glad to be part of Trinity and P Flag. Good. Thank you, Toby. I'm glad we could be of support to you. And this illustrates, I think, the uh, manifestation of courage that comes after you get support and uh, we help along the way. Very good. I also heard the the importance of having multiple communities yes. of support. Mm -hmm. So yes. from from Goodyear to P Flag mm -hmm. to Integrity to Trinity, uh, we sure. we are all parts of individual communities, and we are mm -hmm. all parts of overlapping communities. Yeah, absolutely. And if we include yeah. uh, our role as parents in that, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. colleagues, and we continue to build all of these overlapping communities, then then we're creating. A, a more just world. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think another I should. Question? Do we have another question? Yeah, we. Yeah. How do we find you? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, if you wait, those are my cookies. Grab a cookie. <laughs> oh man. Uh, and take your cell phone and take a picture of our QR code and sign up. To, to join our newsletter, um, you can find us on, on, the, on a, our website, uh, but this would generate a um, bi-monthly newsletter to you if you'd like, and there are copies of the newsletter here. A couple more things about PFLAG is that we offer an annual scholarship for uh, high school students graduating or just in, uh, being admitted to higher education, so that's one thing uh, we're doing uh, to benefit the community. Uh, we also train um, pediatric residents at Metro and university hospitals. And I'm personally working on my own department of psychiatry to get some UH psychiatry residents to come through and experience what a PFLAG meeting is like. And universally, uh, the residents who do come through and, and witness this experience will write us and tell us what an amazing moment they had. So we're on the website, www.pflagcleveland, all one word, dot org. Uh, we have brochures here for you, and please uh, yeah, look us up. It's as easy as clicking an RSVP, yes, I want to attend to next month's meeting in July. And, and our support group meetings uh, have been meeting the same, same time of the month every year mm -hmm. for 37 right. years, and that's the mm -hmm. second Tuesday of every month in the evening from 6.45 to 8.30 p.m. And uh, th at least mm -hmm. through the end of this year, we're right. completely on Zoom, so you'll find a link on our mm -hmm. website to RSVP to that meeting. Um, eventually, we may be back in person here at Trinity. Uh, you know Commons. we have a Zoom room. Yes, yeah, we right? I, I, think, I think having this experience uh, brings back so many memories that I'm, I'm on the board, but uh, I only, only one vote, but I do believe as we emerge from or tolerate this pandemic in safe ways that we can be back here. I wanna be back here, uh, and we're probably looking at a hybrid approach. Currently, you're all welcome to come to our picnic, which will be in, in, in August, and I think we, yes, we will- Yes, it's Berea still. Yes, it is. Yeah. So, Sunday, uh, August 14th. Uh, come join us at one of, our, one of those events, but please know uh, I think it's time that we uh, come back to Trinity as well. We hope so. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you everyone for being here in person. For those of you who are joining online, we thank Jess Sellers and Ashley Fahey yeah, and you. all of those members of, and leaders of PFLAG 
for your work and your presence today. Welcome. Hey, thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you.